Helpless by Bad Horse. She flew on in the unending twilight. Beneath her was purple. It was impossible to see exactly what it was, or how far below her, or how far it stretched in every direction, for there were no landmarks, no boundaries, no shadows, just a hypnotic, slow rippling. Only by the speed or slowness of its motion could one guess whether a wave was a nearby ripple or a far-off ocean swell. Once she thought she had been high above the ooze, and only a lucky glimpse of a ball of white, her own blood reflection, had saved her from flying right into it. Some unmeasurable time ago, she had grown too weary to hold up the sun. He had sunk into the ocean of slime with a burning hiss, and when the tower of steam cleared, he had left an immeasurable black crater behind. For a few bright seconds, she thought he might have caused the stuff some harm, but the wound closed in on itself with a loud plopping sound, leaving behind only a slick black spiral smear on the surface. Just three colours. Dark blue above, a purple welt below, and a dim blob of white bobbing in between. It was not a true purple, but a sickly blue and red tinged mixture of every colour swirled together, stirring slowly into infinitely fine vortices and spirals. Equestria absorbed and averaged together. It seemed wrong for the laws of optics to make so many bright things cancel each other out into dull grey. It was quiet as apocalypses went, not so silent that it sucked the breath out of you, like the grey cinder worlds whose ashes she had trodden, worlds too spent to raise the wind to blow away a puff of ash, not raging like the worlds that had ended in fields of lava belching sulphur, not hissing and biting like the wind across endless plains of snow, broken here and there by ghoulish ice statues. Just a gentle, persistent, sucking sound, like an ocean sloshing against the bottom of an endless pier. As she flew, she replayed the final centuries in her mind over and over, looking for warnings she could have heeded, precautions she could have taken. But no obvious turning point could have prevented this without causing that. It seemed the universe hated harmony, and pushed back harder the closer it came to it. Even reifying it into its component elements had only made the final fall harder and faster. The power needed to hold a world together in harmony could also tear it apart. No revelation, just faces and voices. Faces and voices. The only mark of the passage of time was a dimming of the light, and a settling of the ocean as the purple mass consumed itself, squandering the fruits of millions of years of life in confused and conflicting waves, defecating heavy black tendrils into itself that sank beneath the waves. All the faces and voices. How long did it take? Long. How far did she fly? Far. How tired was she? The world beneath her shrank as it cooled and solidified, drawing itself together until the dark curve of its horizon was visible. By then, the only light was the glow of the mare herself, which pulsed in white waves from her body, in hot yellow shimmers from her horn. She touched down on the featureless black surface. Only then did she allow herself to think on how tired her wings were. The moment she did, they dried up into gossamer grey cobwebs and crumbled into dust, leaving a bare, smooth patch behind her shoulders. The butler waited there. That was how she thought of him. He had four legs and a tail this time, but was tall and dark and wispy as always, like the shadow of the smoke of a fire. She trotted toward him. When she drew near, he looked at her calmly, with eyes incapable of surprise or expectation. He held out a sharp dark spike, so hard and bright pointed that the hand or hoof holding it was too insubstantial by comparison to be seen. It was more like a slashing interruption of space than an object one might idly toss or spin on the basis of no higher authority than the laws of physics. Nonetheless, she took it between her teeth and gripped it like a bit. The butler did not quite nod in response, but his eyebrows may have momentarily raised a hair's width in acknowledgement. He turned his head slightly to the left, directing her attention. Before them stretched the road. It was black, slick, and every bit as hard as the bit of unspace she clenched between her teeth. It would have been as frictionless as theory, if not for the rows of short grooves etched lengthwise on its surface. Each groove was a little over an inch long, with dozens of parallel grooves per row. Her eyes followed the rows of grooves one by one. By the time she had lost them where they and the road vanished at the horizon, she was breathing hard, and her legs were shaking. She took an involuntary step back. 
The butler tactfully averted his eyes up and to the left a few degrees, as if to say, It is regrettable, but don't say I didn't warn you. She nickered once, soft and low. She began to walk down the road, and the butler followed after. Walk is a brisk word for their movement. She took a deep breath before each step. The grooves in the road seemed not merely to stop her from sliding, but to pull at her and drag her to a halt. They sent vibrations up her legs, whispering, Remember us. Remember us. So many faces and voices. With every step she stopped and stared at one or another of the countless scratches. Some her eyes passed over with a shudder, others she gazed at for a long time. Behind her, when she moved on, each thin groove glistened with a ribbon of white light. By the time they had gone a mile, her glow had dimmed to a cool blue, or perhaps the darkness had thickened. The landscape seemed too worn down to present any definitive shape or silhouette, too tired to catch the light and reflect it properly. She was limping now, stepping very gingerly and grimacing each time she set a hoof down. It was hard to see in the dim light, but a darker liquid dripped behind her now, coalescing into blobs and skittering off the road into the darkness. Her limp seemed off, even for a limp, and strangely quiet. Her hooves were too short. The soles of her hooves had worn away. The butler looked down at the bloody pads exposed underneath, and his brows narrowed and his eyes flicked upwards by the tiniest angle, as if he was severely put upon by this foolishness. Several times she shuddered and almost fell, but caught herself. The butler expressed eloquently with his eyelids his commendation of her for avoiding making such a scene. After they had gone another mile, her steps resounded with hoof-like clicks again, for she had worn through the fatty pad down to the toe's coffin bone. Trailing away to the horizon behind them, the narrow groove glistened with the slivers of herself she had left behind, body and soul. Another mile on, she screamed and fell for the first time. A horse's hoof seemed solid, but there are nerves buried deep within its centre. The butler actually raised an eyebrow. She struggled to her feet and continued. The second time she fell, she lay sprawled on the black surface, gasping and trembling. The light within her dimmed to a cold sapphire glow. Her skin clung to the road beneath her. The butler knelt on all fours beside her. He slowly stretched out one shadowy limb toward the dark spike between her teeth, gently, like one offering to take a heavy load. She jerked her head away and began to crawl. The groove sucked and pulled at her like leeches as she dragged herself across them. They seemed now to drain every part of her equally. As she went, her horns slowly shriveled and cracked. Her ears sagged and then hung limp like a dog's. Her legs dwindled to short, boneless noodles flapping ahead of and behind her. The butler stood behind her with an air of infinite patience, moving each foot one step forward every time she managed to wriggle, snake-like, another body length forward. Her light dimmed like a fire burning down to the coals. An observer might have said that this went on for a long time, but there was no standard by which to measure time, other than the mind of the butler who was indifferent to it, and whatever mind remained in the Icarus Pale Serpent, which was enveloped in a fog of pain and concentration, no longer anchored to the world of seconds and inches. It slunk forward, its horn crumbled away, its skin faded to translucent, and its limbs shrunk inch by inch as they were gradually absorbed into its body or into the road. The mad stare on what was left of its face seemed to come from farther and farther away as its eyes clouded over and shrunk to pinpricks. Still it slithered onward, now only a dimly phosphorescent slug leaving a glistening trail behind. The slug quivered. Its nose, which had melted away and was now merely too vertical to latten the slits above its mouth, slowly bent down and touched the road before it. One final line of grooves went halfway across the road and then stopped. Beyond it was virgin, uncut, featureless and black. The slug reached its head sideways and out, lowering the sharp end of the spike to the smooth surface just beyond the last groove. Then it contracted its body, pulling its head back towards itself, dragging the end of the spike across the surface of the road. As it did, it remembered. As it remembered, the memories flowed into the spike, heating it red hot, and sparked and burned themselves into the surface of the road. It remembered being one white speck among the vast green swells of microscopic life, drifting peacefully as they fed from the sun. It remembered growing, slowly, an inch a year, absorbing minerals from a rock, leading a sluggish but tough army of lichens and fungi from the ocean and across the barren, rocky land, 
It remembered leading the first school of mudskippers, flipping and hopping desperately between evaporating puddles, from the rivers to uninhabited inland pools. It remembered the sudden explosion of shapes and forms. It remembered being a her instead of an it. It remembered the first small furry creature that, when she pointed up, looked up at the sky in wonder instead of at her paw. It remembered a part of itself that had needed room to grow and more time. It had called it sister. It remembered the ponies, all of them, one by one, from the first to the last. Every foal's first step and first fall, every love, every fight, every dream, every final breath. For each soul, weak or strong, cruel or kind, a silver drop, brighter and thicker than water, spilled from the thing's eyes and fell heavily to the road. When it had finished, its eyes had dripped nearly away and fallen inward into its eroded head like sinkholes, and there was one more shallow groove cut into the surface of the road. The magic of Equestria had no more reality here. It was just a story that had been told once, somewhere. But the deep magic that Equestria had been built on was still in force. The price it demanded to build a new world was slight and terrible. Someone had to remember it when it was gone. The butler reached out his hoof again, and this time the slug thing let him take the spike from its mouth. He wiped it off fastidiously with a black kerchief, and it disappeared into his smoky folds of skin or clothing or nothingness. The ground shuddered. The world groaned, creaking and croaking, a low, tired sound. The butler wavered slightly on his four legs, and the slug's body rippled in waves as the exhausted world hunched its shoulders and began to curl in on itself in the darkness around them. There was a slow, rumbling, tearing sound, like a god ripping off a crusted scab, as the world contracted and tore away from the road. The blackness off to either side became deeper and blacker as the land fell away and in on itself. This too might have been said to have gone on for a long time, if anyone with an interest in such details had been there to measure it. When it was over, the world lay huddled together in a cold, dark ball there at the end of the road. The only light left in the universe was a faint purple glow deep inside the translucent belly of the slug. If it went out, there was nothing anywhere that could ever reignite it again. The butler looked at the world, then turned down towards the slug and tilted his head. A butler is a creature that rarely expresses an opinion, but when it does, can give a soliloquy in the alteration of one syllable and a complete dissertation in the elevation of an eyebrow. The only motion in the universe was the turning and the tilting of the butler's head. One might as well say that it stood still while the rest of the butler and the rest of the universe rotated about it. Here is a brief summary of what that motion said. Look at the length of the road behind you. So much pain, so much loss. See how much its memory has taken just from you alone. Multiply the pain and the loss you feel by a world. Now all is one again. Let it have its well-earned sleep. Let its disassembled souls rest in peace. Do not ask them to try again. Do not put them through the humiliation of failing one more time. Have mercy on them, if not on yourself. No more suffering. No more indignities. Have the wisdom to accept the end. Dignity. Rest. Peace. Forever and ever. The slugs in the fire dimmed and dimmed, and all around them the darkness held its breath in anticipation. But the butler did not know a deeper magic, which says that anything that can drain a soul can, at a different time or from a different angle, fill it up again and more. The slug spilled back towards the last groove it had carved in the road, and reached out a thin tendril of a pseudopod that seeped into it, filling it. It waited, feeling that scar in the road as if listening for a pulse or an answer. A light flickered at the tips of that tendril. Then the slug raised itself up to its full height, opened its wreck of a mouth, and took a deep breath. Let's try some more time, it slurred, and reached out with one burning finger to touch the world. 